like to invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of First Peter. First Peter, we're looking at chapter 1, looking at verses 6 through 9. As you're turning there, or turning on your phone and scrolling down to whatever, make sure you uh, delete Angry Birds at the same time, all right? Let me ask you guys, have you guys stopped and just noticed that a decade is passing? Think about it. 2020. What? For some reason, like, yes! The other's like, oh my gosh, it's been that long. Oh. Have you guys just stopped about it? I mean, think about it. From 2010 to 2019, think about it. A lot has happened, I'm sure, for each and every single one of you. I mean, I look at back at my life. Oh, my goodness. I remember when I got my first iPhone. I remember graduating from high school and college and grad school. I remember how I moved from Maryland to college to Kentucky and then down here to South Florida and trying to settle in. I found a new church family to call home. And I made many, many new friends. I mean, I thank God for all those things. But if I'm like you and every single human being on God's green earth, this past decade has not always been good. In fact, I'm sure that in this past decade, you have seen or felt and experienced hurt, pain, grief, apathy, suffering, and many other events and moments of the like in your life. The title of this sermon is Resolve to Rejoice in Your Sorrows. Resolve to Rejoice in Your Sorrows. And in 1 Peter, Peter, the Apostle Peter, is writing to Christians who are scattered throughout the Roman Empire, particularly in certain areas of modern-day Turkey. And he's writing to encourage them to press on living the Christian life in the midst of suffering. So let's read verses 1 through 9. Our time today is going to be focused on verses 6 through 9, but we're going to look at those first five verses for context. So hear the word of the Lord in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has called, uh, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word. It is inerrant. It is true. It is sufficient and necessary for all of life and godliness. And I pray that God will write his truths on our souls so we may live in light of the gospel. Amen. The main point I want us to get at, and I think what the Lord is trying to show us through this text is this. Christians are resolved to rejoice in their sorrows because their joy is found beyond their sorrow. Let me say that again. This is the main idea. Christians are resolved to rejoice in their sorrows, because their joy is found beyond the sorrow. As we prepare to enter a new decade, my prayer is that we will be resolved to rejoice in our sorrows, because we have a joy that is far greater than our sorrows. But how do we deal with pain and sorrow when our lives are met with all sorts of suffering and trials? And that's where I wanted to draw our attention to the beginning of verse 6. He says this, In this you rejoice. That's the main clause, so to speak, of 
verses 6 through 9. In this you rejoice. But the question we ask is, well, what's the this? What are Christians to rejoice in? Well, that goes back to verses 1 through 5. In fact, we're learning about, in verses 1 through 5, who we are and where we're going. So there are two things that we're to rejoice in. It's who we are or our identity, and it's according to the triune God. Look at the first couple of verses there. According to Peter, Christians are elect exiles. Christians have been chosen by God, rescued from their former bondage to sin and Satan, and brought into the kingdom of God. We belong to the kingdom of God, but however, life is not like what it seems. Right now, we're living our present lives in a world that is corrupted, once good, but corrupted by sin. And this new identity that we have is not based on us. It's based on God's foreknowledge in that he chose to know us as his people. We didn't deserve it. We don't deserve to be known by God as his people. But it's by the power of the Holy Spirit we have been sanctified or made holy. God, through the Holy Spirit, has declared us righteous. No longer are we guilty because of our sinful nature, but we are declared holy, not guilty, innocent. But what's the purpose of this new identity? At the end of verse 2, Peter writes that Christians are called to be obeying Jesus and to be sprinkled or purified by his blood. So think about our identity, guys. If you're a Christian, (laughs) you got it really good. Your identity is amazing. But it's more than just their identity. It's where are they going? Where are Christians looking to? Where are they living for? Not only do we rejoice in our new identity, but we rejoice in our destiny. See, we have a new destination, and Peter gives praise to God who caused Christians to be born again with a new life that is looking forward to a living hope, eternal life with God forever when Jesus comes again. Because Jesus rose from the dead, those who are hidden in him through faith have an eternal inheritance, one that does not spoil or rot. Our whole salvation from when we were born again and declared righteous before God to when we see Jesus face to face is secure because God's power guards our salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So think about all that Peter's covered in the first five verses. Why wouldn't you want to rejoice in that? I mean, think about it. We have been given a new identity. We've been given a living hope. Our our, it's, it's amazing. We are secure in Christ. But then you get to verse 6. And Peter takes a slight turn with a sentence that is very uncomfortable because he says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. What? There are three points from these four verses that I want us to see and apply to our lives today, not just for 2020, but for every year and every day and every hour and every minute of our lives. And first is this. First, the reality of trials. Second, the purpose of trials. And fourth, the joy that endures trials. Let me say that again. The reality of trials, the purpose of trials, and the joy that endures trials. Point number one, the reality of trials. Look at that verse again. Let me say that for you. Verse six, in this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Now, I don't know about you, but that just doesn't rub me the right way, does it? When you think like, oh, trials? What? What's your gut thought or reaction when you hear the words suffering, grief, trials, pain, testing, and all the plethora of nouns and adjectives that we can add to that list? There are several gut reactions. I mean, I can think of several gut reactions that I would choose. I would complain. Why, Lord? Wait, why is this happening to me? Or maybe you can run away or retreat from it. You know, I just don't want to deal with this. I'm not dealing with this. Just run away. Avoid it. You could show entitlement. Wait, I don't deserve this. Wait, I don't deserve this in my life. What did I do wrong, God? I'm doing all right. How does this have to happen to me? What did I ever do to you, God? Or you can just ignore it with something else. You try to drown it out. This is called the smothering 
reaction. I just don't want to deal with this right now, so we pour alcohol abuse on there. We put drugs on there. We throw lustful thoughts and lustful viewings, and we throw entertainment. We just try to drown the noise of the trial. Or it could be indifference or trying to tough it out. Oh, just got to work harder. Just got to get through this. Not a big deal. Just tough it out, you know. Just do a bunch of stuff. But what's God's attitude towards trials? I mean, think about it. If the Holy Spirit has given us the written word of God through Peter's pen in 1 Peter, what does the Holy Spirit say about trials? And there are four things, and they're just from, really, this verse in verse 6. First, trials are real. Trials are real. The Bible is unabashed about the reality of trials. Trials exist. Peter writes, you have been grieved. Because he assumes that these Christians are going through trials right at that moment. And they have gone through. These believers have seen hurt, experienced pain, endured much hardship. And Peter acknowledges that pain. So, brother, sister, Christian, notice this. God is telling you this. It is okay to grieve. Say that again. It is okay to grieve. God is telling you that. In fact, Grieving is necessary in the Christian life. I don't know about you, but there seems to be a stigma against right expressions of emotion, particularly grief. I'm not saying complaining. Those bad responses, that's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about the right, real response to hardship, pain, and suffering that says, this is not good. This is not good. And there are there are stereotypes of this even in the church. Let me give you three um, stereotypes for what a good Christian should be like in relationship to emotion. There's the first one. is I like to call this the shiny, happy people Christian. You know the shiny, happy people Christian. That's the title of a song by R.E.M., shiny, happy people holding hands. Shiny, happy people laughing. What is this? It's the person that thinks, oh, you got to always be happy. you got to show people you don't have any problems, so we just put happy face. I mean, think about it. You probably walk the study. Oh, my goodness, i got a bunch of problems in my life. Oh, i got to go to church. i got to put a happy face. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, what's going on, Joseph? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. How are you doing, brother? Better than I deserve. God's grace is sufficient. I'm in my season. Wait, what are you talking about? No, no, trials are real, right? So we got the fake happy people, but then you guys have the frozen chosen. You know, this is all about the intellect. I know the truth. Don't no, show emotion. Emotion's bad. No emotion. Just be quiet and motionless. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. So we have the fro- so we have the shiny happy people, you know, always giddy. Probably looks like me, except all the time, but uh, and then you have the frozen chosen. It's all logical. It's all, don't show emotion. Emotion's bad. But then you also have kind of what we had in the previous response, the tough Christian. Come on, man. Just got to have a little more faith, man. Come on, just do a bunch of things. Obey God, all right? Just do a bunch of things. Hey, how are you doing your quiet times, man? How you? So you have the people, what needs fixing? So you have the fake happiness. You have the stoic, no emotion, because emotions are bad, and then you have, we just got to deal with this, just got to get through this, just got to get through this, come on, we got to do something. But what does the verse say here? These Christians are building their lives on their living hope. Their living hope informs their emotion. What does Christian biblical grief show? It shows that this world and this life is not what it should be. Christian grief shows that sin has broken our lives and our world, and therefore trials are real. But second, not only are they real, trials are various kinds. Guys, Peter doesn't say that there's only one specific type of trial here. He says various. There are all kinds of trials in this view. Now, we can assume that the early church was going through physical persecution. But is that all that it is, just physical persecution? No. These trials can be all sorts of things. It could be your sin or the consequences of your sin against yourself and others. Think of pride, lust, greed, anything of that nature, despair, anxiety, or it could be your others sinning against you and the consequences of their sin against you. For example, ungodly arguments, fights, relational strife, slander, gossip, I mean, you name it. Or it could be the brokenness of living with a fallen, what was good, but now corrupted by sin, body and world, depression, disease, death, suicidal thoughts, natural disasters, 
loneliness, war. Trials are not just persecution. There are a lot of things. But third, they're only for a little while compared to eternity. Thankfully, these trials and sufferings have a due date, but temporary can mean any amount of time. It could be a day. It could be a week. It could be a month. It could be a year. It could be several years. It could be your entire life on earth until Jesus comes. Fourth, so we see that they're real, they're various, they are a little wild, but they are necessary for the Christian life. The Bible knows nothing of suffering being non-purposeful because the Christian life assumes that suffering will come as Christians journey to the kingdom of God. In fact, Acts chapter 14, verse 22, Paul and other missionaries are traveling throughout the cities they already reached, and he says this, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, troubles, hardships, we must enter the kingdom of God. Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Suffering is the road on which all true believers will journey on their pilgrimage to their home, the kingdom of God. In fact, I had one professor of biblical counseling named Jeremy Pierre say this, negative emotions are necessary to the Christian experience. Let me say that again. Negative emotions are necessary to the Christian experience. So, how are you doing right now? Friends, how are you in the past? Are you experiencing a trial today? What were your expectations towards suffering to begin with? Was it suffering and annoyance? Something to get rid of? Something you just don't want to deal with? Or do you see suffering as the means that God uses in your life. So we see that trials are reality in the Christian life. But what is the purpose of our trials? And the purpose of our trials is this, so that your faith in Christ will be on full display. Look at verse 7. He writes this, so that, why? Why are these trials is it? That the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory. The first thing I want us to look at is this, the nature of our faith. In fact, let me give you guys a definition of what faith is. Faith is, according to the Bible, is total trust and dependence on God and his promises, especially in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Total trust and dependence on God and his promises, especially in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, I would actually add something to it. It could be better understood as one's total allegiance to Jesus Christ. The object of our allegiance is not ourselves. Instead, we pledge allegiance to Jesus alone. But notice the description Peter uses for Christian faith in that verse. Because notice, he says that this faith, that the tested genuineness of your faith, the idea is that our faith is proven to be true. It's challenged. It's demonstrated to be real. Our faith is shown to be legit. Through testing one's faith is shown to be either real or not real. It's not that you lose your salvation. The Bible knows nothing of that. It's not saying that one can lose his or her salvation. Either the person has faith or does not have faith. And the way we know is through trials. That's what the text is saying. And what is the process of our, the refining of our faith in Christ? If that's the purpose of trials, then how is our faith being tested? He's saying that sufferings are used as the crucible for faith to show what we really trust in. I mean, think about it. Pa Peter uses the imagery of gold being refined. When gold is refined, think about this for a moment. What changes in the gold? Nothing. The amount of the gold is not added or subtracted. The gold stays the same. So what changes? What changes is the impurities that are in the gold. They're not part of the gold. They're not is gold. They are stuck there. And what happens is the refining gets rid of the dross. 
and the impurities in the gold are removed. And although gold perishes, in the same sense, God is using trials and suffering in our lives to refine our lives of faith in Christ. Your faith in Christ doesn't change as if it has a different amount, you know. What changes is anything and everything that hinders you from living in light of the living hope you have hidden in Christ. Trials show whether or not your faith is authentic. And what makes your faith far more valuable than gold is the object of your faith, Christ. Jesus is what makes your faith valuable. And how does, is that value displayed? Through trials. That's why, the apostle, that's why James, the brother of Jesus, can write in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet very, trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The idea is God's using that trial in your life. If that's the process then just like gold being refined and shown that it's precious, the result of your faith journey is that you will be rewarded with praise, glory, and honor when Christ returns. Tom Schreiner, New Testament professor, writes this, God brings suffering into the lives of believers to purify their faith and to demonstrate its genuineness. The eschatological, or the end of days, reward reveals that believers have been transformed by God's grace. Inasmuch as they rejoice in God, so much they are willing to undergo pain. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 13. Peter later writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now, to get a bigger picture and understanding of that, just by looking at my physical structure, you can tell that I have never been part of our armed forces. I definitely, I, I like the military, but I definitely will not survive there. But I know many people who have been in the military. And in fact, I was hanging out with one of our church members, our Gospel Life members, who was actually part of the military, specifically the Coast Guard. If you want to know who it is, just that coffee and conversation, just ask any guy, and once you find out, he'll tell you all about it. Anyway, so this guy, he mentioned boot camp, and he mentioned this to me. He, this is what he was saying. He's like, yo, man, I starved to death. They made us starve to death. They made us sleep for, like, short hours. They screamed in our faces, man. It was hilarious. They made us exercise to the point where our muscles couldn't move. Okay, cool. You know what's so funny about that, though? He was laughing the whole time while I was talking about that. I'm like, why are you laughing? Why would that guy be laughing at his experience at Bukhara? I mean, that's horrible, right? Well, think about it. It's because he's a member of the Coast Guard. Think about it for a moment. He proved that he has what it takes to become a member of the Coast Guard. In fact, people who drop out of boot camp can't rejoice in boot camp because they didn't pass through boot camp and become whatever, a Marine Coast Guard member, uh, Army guy, whatever. They can't rejoice in that suffering because they did not go through it and they did not become who they are. So, brother, sister, Christian, I declare to you this morning, this life you are living is the boot camp that's preparing us for the living hope to come. The purpose of all these kinds of trials are so that you will persevere, trusting in Christ, and display your faith in Christ. You will grow, not in the sense that you didn't have faith or had a small amount of faith, but you will grow in that you will see Jesus more and more for who he is and prove that all you have is him as the impurities of sin are chipped away through trials. So what is the dross in your life that needs to be purified out? What are the other hopes that are hindering you from living out your faith in Christ and displaying the living hope you have in him? Does your life in the midst of trials show dependence on Christ or dependence on you fill in the blank? So let me back up for a moment. We recognize the reality of trials and the 
in the Christian life. And now we see the purpose of God in the trial. But how do we endure, though? How do we rejoice in the midst of trials? And that goes to point number three, the joy that endures trials. What empowers Christians to endure such hardships? It's this love and joy that comes from knowing and believing what Jesus has done for us. It's love and joy that comes from knowing Jesus and believing in what he has done for us. Look at the last two verses, verses 8 and 9. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation soul, that's verse 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. It's filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now, my immediate reaction to reading that was like, wait, really, Peter? Are you serious? Inexpressible joy. How is that even possible? You can't be serious, Peter. Oh, Peter's serious. Peter is so serious. Why? Because these Christians continue to meditate on Jesus Christ and the salvation he has given to them. Remember, Peter is using the term salvation to describe the whole package of salvation. He's not just talking about being born again or getting saved, as we use today's language. But he's also talking about the life of the Christian. And specifically, the living hope you have in Christ when you die or when he comes back. You have a living hope. And Jesus suffered and died in our place and rose from the dead so that we can experience salvation for our lives and not lose heart. So last year, I preached a sermon called Resolved to be Looking to Jesus. And I preached from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. But here's the, I have a a confession to make. I am sorry, because I forgot verse 3. Let me pull up the verse right now. Like, pull that up for a second here. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all right, so other saints of old, from the Old Testament to New Testament to the saints of the past, right? Let us also lay aside every way and sin. Let's take it off. The sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the Lord God. Let's stop that for a second. Okay, yes. So lay aside every way and sin. Tear it off. Keep running. Keep looking to Jesus. Verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Look at how Jesus suffered for you so that when you're in suffering, you don't lose heart. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. He might bring us to God. You see, every person has rebelled against God, who is the true and good king of the universe and deserves our worship. And because of our sin and rebellion against God's holy, beautiful, infinite character, we deserve his just, righteous wrath against our sin. But God being rich in mercy and grace, by the way, we don't deserve it. It's in spite of us. He sent the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, to come as a baby and live like a man, to obey God the Father perfectly. We could never accomplish that. To die in our place, the death we are supposed to die, by taking God's righteous punishment for our sin. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the throne on high, victorious over sin and death, so that those who trust in him will be born again to a living hope. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Christianity. That's what makes Tom Schreiner say this. Believers who suffer are not dashed to the ground by their troubles. They love Jesus Christ and rejoice in him, even though they have never seen him and do not see him now. Their lives are characterized by a hope that fills the present with love and joy. Brother, sister, Christian, hear this. You can rejoice in your sorrow because your joy is found beyond the sorrow. 
You can rejoice in your sorrow because your joy is found beyond the sorrow. Your joy is found in Christ. We, are, we finite Christians, sinners saved by God's grace, have infinite joy that comes from knowing the infinite God and Savior who rescued us. Our joy is secure because Christ is our joy. Therefore, you can rejoice. You will rejoice. We now have seen the reality of trials in the Christian life. We now know the purpose of various trials in our lives. And now we know the joy that endures these trials and suffering. But how do we apply this to today? What does this look like in our lives as we go through our everyday life where we go through suffering? Or if suffering hasn't come, guess what? It will come. There are three verbs I want us to remember. And it's really simple. It's rejoice grieve and obey rejoice grieve and obey so let's talk about rejoice rejoice we're to rejoice in who god has saved you to be rejoice in who god has saved you to be so often in our culture and even in our own lives the wrong thing to do is this we often look in ourselves for our identity in fact, that's what our commercialized culture is pressuring us to do. Not only that, the moral landscape and atmosphere of our society is saying this. Find meaning in yourself. Look in yourself. The answer is in you. But notice the freeing truth and wonder that God is declaring to you this morning in this passage. You were made and saved by God. You were made and saved by God and for God. I mean, think about it. Look back at those first two verses. This is what we need to remind ourselves. We need to remind ourselves of who we are in Christ. Actually, let's even step back for a second. You and I, as Christians, need to remind ourselves of who we are according to the triune God. Because notice what God the Father says about you. God the Father says this, I chose to know you and for you to have the privilege of knowing me. The Holy Spirit is saying to you, I declared you holy and blameless in the Father's sight. And notice what Jesus has been screaming at us this morning. Your life is for obeying me because I was crushed for you. I died for you. I suffered so that you may live. If you're here this morning and you would not consider yourself to be a born-again Christian, I appeal to you today, come and know this triune God. Come and know and become who you are supposed to be in Christ. You may be visiting for the first time or second time and still wondering what Christianity thing is all about. Or maybe you've been coming so for a very long time, but maybe it's finally clicking right now. Don't ignore that. Come and turn away from your sin and the life of you trying to become your own king and queen of your life. Throw your crown on the ground. Look to Jesus and embrace him as the true good king who came to rescue you so that you will experience eternal joy, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, escape from the Father's wrath. Trust in him today. And brother, sister, Christian, your entire life is wrapped up in the Trinity. But here's some questions that we need to ask for ourselves. I want to encourage you to ask yourself. First, think about this. Do you see your life and trials as the story God is writing to display his glory? Do you see your life and the trials of your life as the story God is writing to display his glory in you and through you? Here's another question to ask. Are you reminding yourself every day of your identity in Christ through reading his word and meditating on his word? How are you going to remind yourself of who you are in Christ if you're not in what he says, his speech written down for us? Are you thanking God through prayer to him and praying, thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for me? Are you thanking the Father for choosing you to save you you didn't deserve that. Are you thanking the Holy Spirit for making you holy in God's sight? Are you thanking? Are you praying to Him? And how are you surrounding yourself with other saints who can remind you of how God saved you and whom God has made you 
to be. So rejoice. Rejoice in who God has saved you to be. But second, I want you to grieve. I want you to grieve and rejoice in the midst of God's work in your trial. Let me remind you what Jeremy Pierre says. Negative emotions are necessary to the Christian experience. But here's the question that we have to ask about that question, though. Because the question is whether or not that grief or emotion is informed by our joy in Christ and the living hope. Because there are wrong ways to grieve and express emotion that are centered and built on our own selves rather than on God and his promises and the gospel. So think about this. Let me pop a passage over here. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9-10. through 10. Let's make this kind of like a litmus test, so to speak. He writes this. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So notice how grief is the tool, the means that God is using to shape and form us. Now here's the question, though. What is worldly grief? We know what godly grief is. Godly grief leads us to repent or to turn away from sin. I don't want to do, I don't want to pursue sin. I'm not ruled by sin. I'm going to worship Jesus. I'm turning to Jesus, turning away from sin, obeying Jesus. That's what godly grief leads us to. But then what's worldly grief? Well, look at the text. Worldly grief is grief that doesn't lead to turning away from sin. Instead, worldly grief is basking in sin, staying in sin. Worldly grief and emotion, in fact, depends on a hope other than God. Worldly emotion depends on a hope that is anything but God. So, in our own lives, we need to grieve and express emotion in accordance with who God is and what he has spoken in Scripture. So later in chapter, in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about this thorn in his side, right? And he even says this in verse 8, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Get rid of this, God. I don't want to deal with it. But verse 9, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness therefore i will boast all the more gladly in my weakness why so that the power of christ may rest upon me for the sake of christ then i am content with weaknesses insults hardships persecutions and calamities for when i am weak then i am strong notice how paul is saying god is using grief and sorrow to help us trust and depend on him. To, we're depending on his grace, his strength in our lives. So grief is the diagnosis. Okay, what's going on here? All right, let's put grief in there. Boom, what pops up? Am I depending on Christ and his strength to endure? Or am I just saying, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to get rid of this. What is your reaction to suffering? Do, what is God trying to remove or refine in you so that your life is more dependent on your living hope. How is God wanting to use your grief to draw your heart closer to him? And as a congregation, as a local body of believers, we need to grieve and comfort one another with the comfort that God gives. Notice, it's not the, the comfort that I have. It's the comfort that God gives. It's not, the grief is not the end of itself. Grief is used so to, it could direct us to God. So as the life of our local church, as Gospel Life Church, how are we comforting one another and showing emotion to one another that accords with Scripture? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-5. to It's on the screen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Why? For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Notice where the source of comfort is. It's in God through Jesus Christ. And as we, as God's people, as the body of Christ, endure the same sufferings Jesus went we too will share the comfort that he has. We as the local church are called to grieve biblically. 
We are not to give the flippant answer, just have more faith. Just get over it. Just do something. No, we are called to grieve and express emotion according to Scripture as the local body of Christ. God's people know that He is at work in our grief and in our rejoicing in the midst of grief. So how does your grief say about who you're trusting in? Are you rejoicing in a different hope? Or are you hoping in the God who is sufficient to sustain you as you grieve in the midst of your trial? So rejoice, grieve, but then obey. Obey Christ, your joy and living hope. Look back at verse 2 for a second. Peter states that the purpose for us being elect exiles, saved by God, is this. It's for obedience to Jesus Christ. The purpose for the Christian life, including our trials, suffering, and pain, is for us to grow in obeying the one who rescued us. In fact, Peter, throughout the whole book, is saying, obey, come, do this, be this attitude. Not because that's in how we get God's favor, but in light of God's favor in our lives, we do this. So, chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself, do something, arm yourself with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. We rejoice in God for what he has done by turning away from our sin, letting go of what other hope we cling to that is not Christ, and obeying him in the midst of suffering because he is the one where true joy resides. So if obedience to Jesus is faith in Jesus displayed, how is God calling you to obey Jesus in the midst of your trial? And I don't know the answer for you. I don't know what trial you're going through. You don't know what trials I'm going through. But the call for us is the same. How is God calling you to obedience to Jesus in the midst of your trial? I don't know what you see when you look back at this past decade. But I'm sure you are like me and you've experienced some trials. And if you haven't, just wait. But I pray that you see that God does care about you, whatever your suffering or trial may be. Whether it's depression or suicidal thoughts or struggles with lust and temptation or relational strife with someone close or even someone you not close because of that or because your family has gone through cancer or you recently grieved the death of a loved one. I don't know what trial you're going through. It may be persecution. I don't know. But whether or not any of those things apply, or maybe there's something else, God cares. I pray that you will see that our trials are meant to display to all the world the living hope that we have in Christ. In fact, hear the words that we just sang that demonstrate how we can rejoice when we are in our sorrows. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. For my life he bled and died 
Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with Him to endless light, He will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight. When He comes at last, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Let's sing one more time. Come on. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Let's pray. Try and God, thank you for saving your saints. Father, we, your local church here in Sunrise, ask that all these truths be applied to the lives of everyone here this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for saving sinners who have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ by faith in his name. It is in his name we ask all these things. Amen.